Hey everybody, I'm Austin with PDQ.com. Here in the office, it's uh, it's holiday season. Uh, whether or not you're watching this during that time, that's uh, that's a different story. But uh, with the holiday season, big thing is uh, Christmas trees, right? Uh, Christmas trees are uh, kind of relating to what we're talking about here. We're talking about uh, a spanning tree today. So let's go ahead and jump into that. Um, so what is spanning tree? Well, to understand spanning tree, we basically have to understand what it's trying to prevent, right? So when somebody talks about a spanning tree loop, what they're talking about is a layer two loop. Uh, and when we say layer two loop, uh, you kind of have to imagine it like, like this, right? Um, I can, I can even draw it out here. No problem. So what we've got here is a, uh, a loop topology, right? Uh, every switch is connected to each other with a port. It, it in itself is a loop. If you were to draw, it, it looks like a circle almost. Uh, so we're going to identify what a loop looks like in terms of network traffic. So PC one is going to send an ARP to switch two. switch two is going to send that ARP through every interface, except the one it received it on. So the ARP will exit out G02 and G30, and every other switch in this topology is going to do the same thing. So we're going to take the perspective of switch one. It's going to receive that ARP on gigabit 30, and then it's going to say, huh, okay, I'm going to send that out every interface except the one I received it on, shoots it out G2 slash zero, switch four receives it on G2 slash zero, and then sends it out uh, G0 slash two. And then switch two receives its own frame again, but it can't identify that that it's its own frame. It assumes it's natural traffic, right? So it's gonna that frame is gonna keep looping, and that's just in one direction. If we want to take the other broadcast that was sent out, when PC one sent that request, we went through G three zero, but one was also sent through G zero slash two, right? So what happens is almost this one packet caused two loops to occur, and this is gonna happen forever until that switch turns off or until you unplug one of these interfaces. Um, and that's on one ARP. And most most uh, broadcast domains are pretty noisy with broadcast, right? So that's where spanning tree is utilized as a tool to prevent these kind of things. It's, it's absolutely required. There's no disabling it, really. Uh, what we have to do is try to understand it. So I'm going to go ahead and exit this topology real quick. All right, so what we've identified is a layer two loop. Let's go ahead and move on from here. The way spanning tree works is it there is a specific data unit that is sent out of every switch every I believe two to three seconds right uh, it's called a BPDU a bridge protocol data unit and it contains information regarding spanning tree so what we're talking about is uh, the source like we'll break down the packet for you in just a second but the destination is a multicast address that most switches should not forward uh, that's why you're not it's going to see uh, a multicast. If, if, if everything was in the same VLAN, you're not going to see a spanning tree or, excuse me, a BPDU from a switch further down the line, if that makes sense. that The interface of the next switch will not forward that MAC or that frame, excuse me. Uh, so we've got two types of BPDUs. This is just for information. We won't break it down too much, but we've got configuration and topology change and notifications uh, on a test. They're probably going to ask a question like that. I would annotate that. Uh, and like I said, BPDUs are sent out every two seconds by every switch through every port, typically. So we've got some basics of spanning tree. Now, the way the spanning tree works is if you were to imagine a tree, right, you've got the root of a tree, the base of the tree, and then every branch kind of spreads out from there, right? So what we have to define is that root of the tree or the root switch in our spanning tree topology, right? Uh, so the way that would work is uh, the lowest priority, which is usually user set, or the lowest base MAC address, which is in the system chassis of the switch, will win, right? Uh, so let's pretend we're looking at our last topology with the three switches. Let's say switch two had a priority of zero, right? Lower priority wins. Uh, so in that case, he would become the root switch. And what the root switch does is it's like, okay, I don't have to worry about anything else at this point. It sets all interfaces to what's called designated mode, which means they are now forwarding uh, packets, they're forwarding data, they're receiving and transmitting BPDUs. And now every other switch except the root switch has to figure out which port it needs to block, right? So let's take the perspective of the uh, another switch in that topology. It identifies that switch two is the root switch, so it immediately sets that interface to a root port. Uh, which means it's designated, it's going to forward traffic. 
because that's the natural flow, right? You want all tree branches to go back to the root in this case. Uh, and then it's going to compete with any other switch it's connected to. So in our topology back there, we had all three switches connected. The two switches that aren't root are going to open up the port, basically, that faces the root switch. And then they're going to decide between the two of them which one is going to block a port, right? Uh, typically, it's the same it's the same kind of thing here. The highest priority will lose. Uh, but typically, in, in, especially in our case, we have it set to the default value, which is 32,000. I, I can't get down to the actual digit there, but it's, it's usually pretty standard. Um, so it's usually the highest interface wins if uh, the MAC address can't break that. So what basically would happen is those two switches would uh, identify, okay, my MAC address is higher or lower than my neighbor's and then block the port respectively if it's a higher MAC address, right? Because lowest MAC address wins uh, for not only root election, but uh, who's going to block which port. I would almost say blocked port election, right? Uh, so only one interface in that entire spanning tree loop is going to block, therefore essentially turning off that that link. It would almost be like unplugging the, the cable, right? Uh, so now that we've kind of identified how spanning tree works at a super basic level, uh, let's go ahead and continue on our, our, our discussion here. Okay, so every switch port within spanning tree, and this is traditional spanning tree, has a state, right? We've got blocking. Uh, so every initialized port begins in blocked, uh, cannot send or receive data, and that's really one word we want to highlight, highlight data, uh, but it is allowed to receive BPDUs, right? You, you want your spanning tree topology to always be aware even if the port is in the blocking state, that if any changes have happened, therefore allowing that port to maybe open up, right, or continue staying closed, it depends on the topology. Uh, the next state is listening. Still, you cannot send or receive data. So that ARP that we were talking about would not pass, but it, the switch is allowed to send and receive BPDUs. So in this case, we're sending BPDUs, we're also receiving BPDUs, and we're negotiating I almost want to say negotiating who is going to block a port in this topology, basically. Uh, so after a, a period of time called the forward delay, uh, you're allowed to uh, still send and receive BPDU, and you're allowed to learn MAC addresses. So that's where this learning phase come from, comes from, right? But you're still unable to uh, forward any data. So again, that ARP is not going anywhere. But the switch is able to recognize that the source MAC address of that ARP Okay, from this place and then annotate it in the MAC address table. Kind of a weird state there. Uh, and then forwarding, the easiest one. Uh, you're allowed to send and receive data. You're also uh, send, sending and receiving BPDUs as well. Uh, it's the typical state of a switch port if it's working correctly, right? Uh, and then there's disabled. Basically, if anyone were to turn off that port in terms of like the admin state or were error disabled, it would go into this disabled state. Now, again, I want to emphasize that this is traditional spanning tree, which we're not seeing anymore in, in 2021. Uh, we'll go into it a little bit more, but rapid spanning tree has kind of reduced the amount of steps required uh, to do this and reduces the time required for you to go from a blocking state to a forwarding state. Uh, so let's continue on. So we've got different types of spanning tree here, right? We've got common spanning tree. So that's the one basically we're talking about here where uh, you can almost say that it's one instance for every switch, right? Uh, which is great, but maybe that your traffic uh, for one VLAN isn't, I would really say, cohesive for this topology that spanning trees created, right? So Cisco kind of came out with per VLAN spanning tree. They did come out with per VLAN spanning tree. It is proprietary. Uh, it's basically one spanning tree instance for every VLAN. Uh, and it uses an old protocol called ISL. It's not really cohesive with common spanning tree. So they came out with per VLAN, per VLAN spanning tree plus. It supports the old common spanning tree and what they at the at then was their predecessor PVST, right? Uh, so if you remember last time we talked about native VLANs, why those are important to know what traffic is going where is in, in spanning tree, the BPDUs on trunk links are set through native VLANs, right? So that's where we're gonna we're tying tying back to episode two. Uh, and that should create a little bit of clarity there. Uh, and then again, we've got rapid spanning tree protocol. It definitely has faster convergence. 
I believe 50 seconds was common spanning tree, and it, it maybe it was 50, 30. Anyways, we don't see common spanning tree too much anymore, but it is a great teaching tool uh, because it's a little bit slower and uh, a little bit easier to break down. Uh, there are less port states in rapid spanning tree protocols. Like, a, like it says here, we've got discarded learning and forwarding. Basically, breaks. Uh, it, it, it combines a bunch of the older states into one, uh, therefore making it a little easier to, to digest. And it doesn't say here, but rapid spanning tree has a lot of efficiencies as well uh, that common spanning tree just didn't have. And then multiple spanning tree protocol is kind of the uh, the standard that pervy land spanning tree is. If I were to to compare the two, pervy land spanning tree is a Cisco proprietary thing. Multiple spanning tree is a standard. Right, uh, but basically, it allows you to tie VLANs to different spanning tree instances. So, in the case of common spanning tree, where maybe one VLAN wasn't supposed to go in the direction that the root switch is, and one is, you can set that with multiple spanning tree protocol. Uh, and again, if you have a thousand VLANs, you're going to have a thousand spanning tree instances with that uh, per VLAN spanning tree, right? So, it allows you to control that a little bit more if you want. We're not going to go too much into multiple spanning tree protocol because it definitely is a little bit more intense than just spanning tree. All right, so we're looking at the lab here. Uh, we've got those three switches like we identified. Let's go ahead and try to control spanning tree in this scenario. Let's say you've got a network like this uh, and you want to define or identify the root bridge in any scenario. Uh, I can try to show you how to do that. Again, this is using Cisco. Uh, other vendors have different uh, commands, but the idea is the same. For sure. So let's go ahead and take a look. We are on switch two. We're going to go ahead and, and enable. We're going to go ahead and show spanning tree. I like to just show span because I'm lazy and don't want to type that much. Um, so I believe we've only got a spanning tree instance for VLAN one here, which is completely true. I'll go ahead and expand this a little bit to give some more eyes. Okay, so there's a lot of things we can identify here, right? First things first, it's VLAN 1. We've got an instant spanning tree instance for VLAN 1. I would hope so with, with uh, Cisco's default VLAN being VLAN 1. Uh, spanning tree is enabled, and the protocol is rapid spanning tree. It doesn't say it here, but it is per VLAN spanning tree. Uh, Cisco doesn't really change that, it, but it is rapid per VLAN spanning tree. So imagine rapid spanning tree, and they mushed it together with per VLAN spanning tree, and that's, that's the baby we have here. Uh, so we've got two things I want to identify. We've got the root ID there, and we've got the bridge ID. So the root ID identifies, okay, what is the priority of the root switch? What is its MAC address, its system MAC address? And then it, in this case, we're identifying that we are the, the root for this, this uh, spanning tree instance. And then it gives a little bit of the timer details that I didn't really break down. We've got hello timers, max A timers, and forward delays, right? Again, there's where forward, forward delay comes back. And then the bridge ID which is going to be the exact same as our root ID because switch two is in charge of this spanning tree instance, right? Let's go ahead and grab switch four and do the same thing. We're going to enable and show span. And we're going to open this up. So we've got the same, same thing here that we were seeing over here in terms of the root ID because switch every switch in that instance should know what the root ID is for that spanning tree instance if that's make, if I'm making any sense there but uh, so we can see that the priority for the root switch in terms of switch four is the same as switch two because switch two is in charge uh, we can see that the addre address is the same but now we see things like cost and port what does that mean right uh, we can I Cost, uh, let's think of it as this. Every interface has a set speed, right? So you've got fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, 10 gigabit Ethernet. Those all have a defined cost to them in terms of spanning tree. And uh, the cost to get to that root switch is defined by how many uh, ports you have to get to to get to the root switch, if, if that's making any sense. So let's say I've got three switches between me and the root switch. Each one is a gigabit, and let's say the, the cost is two, right? So for every hop, you would want to add two on every ingress of, of a BPDU. It's kind of, we're kind of getting a little complicated here, but basically that's where this cost value is defined is the value of that interface, which is a gigabit Ethernet, is uh, 
calculated by the switch on the, I believe it's the ingress of the BPDU, and that is used to find the quickest path to the root sw switch, right? Let's say you have a 10 gigabit ethernet interface and a fast ethernet interface, and they both face the root switch. You're gonna want that 10 gigabit ethernet switch, or excuse me, switch port, uh, forwarding for traffic, right? Spanning tree is capable of understanding the uh, the bandwidth of that interface, right? Uh, we've also got the port here. Every port is defined by a uh, priority number. So as you can see here, uh, there's a column here, call priority number. You see 128.3. That's where that port three is coming from, but it also gives you context of what actual the actual name of the interface is and its speed. Again, we've got timers, all that good stuff. And then uh, our bridge ID defines our priority, our address, our hello times, and our aging times, right? Uh, aging time comes down to if I don't hear from this neighbor in 300 seconds, I'm going to redo my spanning tree instance and uh, try to reelect somebody. So let's uh, let's make switch four in charge. You know, maybe we're feeling a little crazy, a little, a little funky, and we want to kind of break our, our network a little bit. Uh, let's go ahead and do that. So you want to config T in, in Cisco world. You want to say spanning tree. Uh, priority, oh, excuse me, spanning tree VLAN, right? We're in per VLAN spanning tree. Priority, uh, let's say, let's make it zero, right? Now let's go ahead and show span once more. Okay, a little confusing now with both of these, these, uh, these outputs up, but we can see that the priority, it's kind of weird. We've got a priority of one on our root ID, even though we just set the priority of zero, right? Uh, Cisco has a funny way of, of defining the priority. I think it's even per the protocol standard, but basically it takes the VLAN ID and adds it to the priority. So let's say we had VLAN 10 that we were messing with. It, the priority here would be v, prior, uh, 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 set to 10, uh, but basically it's zero, right? Um, so we can see that the root ID is us. We can see that we are the bridge or we are the root for this uh, instance. And uh, we can see other information here. If we go back to switch two, we should see an updated output of show spanning tree. Yep, there we go. We can see that the root port is now on uh, G02. We can see that if we were to compare these two values, I'm looking at the last four values of our root switch over here, 7,500 looks correct over here. Um, so we've now taken control uh, of switch uh, of the root bridge election of switch two to switch four, right? So now I set the priority to zero. If you set two of the same switches with the same priority to zero, you're going to lose the ability to really control it because now you're leaving it into the fate of the system MAC address value. Uh, it's just like leaving it as default, right? Uh, if the priorities are, are the same, it's going to fall back to the MAC address and now you're leaving it to chance. And as system administrators, we don't leave anything to chance, right? So uh, per the example of the lab, I set it to zero, but I would try to set it to the next highest value, which I believe is in the thousands. Uh, but you can fact check me on that. Um, so there we go. That's, that's pretty much controlling and identifying uh, spanning tree in a very simple network. If you guys want me to break it down even further, let us know in the comments, uh, and I would be more than happy to do so. Uh, I believe we're good here. So thank you very much. I'm Austin with PDQ.com and have a great day.